Support for this program is provided by Chevron. We're actually calling it Infrastructure Week in this administration. To deliver the world-class infrastructure. Since it's Infrastructure Week, I'm wondering if the president... uh... (laughs) Infrastructure Week. (laughs) It's all we've been talking about this week, right? Infrastructure. No Infrastructure Week jokes. That's the rule. Always been the rule. I'm Anthony Adragna. This is Politico Energy. And today... But if it ever was going to be Infrastructure Week, it would be right now, because this is something that we haven't seen in a long time. God sure. willing, we're not going to have 40, 40 weeks of uh, this is Infrastructure Week. <laughs> Remember that? Sam Mintz and half our energy reporters on the big infrastructure bill. It's Tuesday, August 3rd. Yeah, so this all started... Interestingly enough, with these um, surface transportation bills uh, out of the EPW committee and Commerce Committee, which were approved a few months ago, um, you know, those are the sort of the the base transportation bills that we're always going to have to pass this year ahead of a fall deadline. Um, And then, you know, as these infrastructure talks sort of started ramping up between President Biden and various groups of bipartisan senators, those bills sort of have been built out into this much broader bill that uh, includes you know, highways, rail, transit, um, a climate section, tons of energy provisions, which you know more about than I do. Um, and it's really a pretty broad piece of legislation. It has a ton of policy in it, including fascinating new policy and policy that's going to be the subject of lots of debate still. Quick review of this. How closely did the actual final text hew to the bills put forward by the head of the Environment Committee, Tom Carper, in both transportation and the water sector? Yeah, well, like I said, the the sort of base bills are still in there. Um, And that was actually a point of contention at one point in these talks, because there were various changes that this bipartisan group had made or was trying to make. But, you know, Tom Carper and the EPW committee members fought to to keep the vast majority of their bills uh, as, again, as the core text of of this bigger bill. And, you know, I think there have been some some moderate changes for sure, but um, they they form the, the core of it for sure. Members of this bipartisan group, um, led by Rob Portman of Ohio and Kirsten Cinema of Arizona, a uh, Democrat, call this a historic bill. As somebody who covers transportation policy, do you think that is a fair description of it? Yeah, I think it is. I mean, it it absolutely increases um, transportation spending in almost every category from the last surface transportation bill, which was in 2015. Like I said, it creates a, a bunch of interesting new policy, maybe some of which we can get into. Uh, in more detail. One thing I'm really interested in is this new Reconnecting Communities pilot program. Um, This is something that, uh, you know, lawmakers and President Biden have been talking about for a while. Um, And basically the idea is that it's a program aimed at um, giving grants to cities or communities to tear down or otherwise um, manipulate um, highways that have basically torn through communities and split apart communities, often minority neighborhoods. And I think that's that's a really fascinating one from my perspective. Hi, I'm Kelsey Tamperino. So the bipartisan bill would provide some boost for the carbon-free sources that advocates say will be crucial to really transitioning to clean energy. Um, That includes $21.5 billion to create a new Office of Clean Energy Demonstrations at the DOE. Notably, the bill would also fully fund $6 billion over five years to keep the nation's struggling nuclear power plants online. Um, The White House is also really touting this measure as a significant investment in clean energy transmission. But the bipartisan bill text includes just $2.5 billion to expand electric power transmission lines through a revolving fund. That's something advocates say falls far short of what is really needed to achieve Biden's clean energy goals. This is Ben Lefebvre, oil and gas reporter for Politico. Uh, The part of the infrastructure bill that interested me most was the fact that uh, the Senate has thrown quite a bit of money towards carbon capture and storage uh, technology. You know, more than $12.5 billion they've thrown at uh, commercialization of CCUS. Um, Just that that dollar figure alone kind of surprised me. Uh, CCUS is still kind of a, you know, controversial technology. There's been several big commercial scale projects, but they have haven't really panned out. It just doesn't seem to be a big uh, technology that, you know, maybe throwing this kind of money will yield a big result. 
Sam, what are we expecting in terms of the process this week? Are we expecting a lot of amendment votes or should this be kind of viewed as more or less the finished product? Yeah, I mean, I think we're we're still waiting to hear exactly how that's going to play out. But we are expecting amendments. We are expecting the Senate will be voting on amendments this week. Um, I don't know exactly how many will be allowed by, by Senate leadership, but the bill is definitely in flux. Um, and I'm really interested to see which policy issues come up as it's on the floor. Um, and I, I think that's a, a really interesting dynamic as well. Well, the bill contains really big investments in transit uh, and rail. It's, you know, the Biden administration has called it $39 billion of new investment in transit. We're still trying to sort of pick apart exactly how that funding breaks down. But um, I think by all accounts, it's a it's a big amount of money in transit. It's not as much as the House would do and Peter DeFazio would do and as much as transit advocates might be calling for. But there is definitely a, a hefty amount of money in there for for the transit industry. Same with rail. I mean, I've seen some some commentary and analysis saying that this bill could basically help transform Amtrak's network. It's not enough to like create a new high speed rail network, which is sort of the progressive dream. But it, it absolutely is a huge amount of money for rail, um, $66 billion for passenger rail. And that could absolutely transform it for Amtrak. And Amtrak has big plans they've been pushing, you know, since the start of the Biden administration about where they'd like to expand. So we should be looking out for that as well. I'm Zach Coleman, and I cover climate and energy for Politico. So the infrastructure bill would put billions of dollars into climate resilience. We're talking about $2.6 billion to NOAA for a lot of forecasting and modeling, talking about coastal resilience and Great Lakes restoration and resilience. You're also looking at billions spent on wildfire management across the Agriculture Department and Interior Department. There's also a bunch of money sent to the Army Corps of Engineers, about $11 billion for inland waterways projects and uh, things of that nature that would improve resilience. Though a lot of environmental groups say that more needs to be done, and especially on the mitigation side of things going forward. For more news on energy and the environment, subscribe to our newsletter at politico.com slash morning energy. If you want to support our show, the best way to do it is by leaving us a rating and review on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you listen. I'm Anthony Dragna. Talk to you again tomorrow. Support for this program is provided by Chevron. Did you know that Chevron supports the ambitions of the Paris Agreement? In fact, they've even tied their executives' compensation to lowering the carbon emissions intensity of their operations. Because it's only human to help power a brighter future.